Good morning. Uh, a few announcements before I get into the sermon. Next week, of course, is Easter, uh, and we are currently planning on having a little Easter egg hunt uh, for the kids that will be here. Uh, and right, right now, I have I have planned to to continue at our pace through John, and that's actually kind of convenient because the text that we will be dealing with next deals with resurrection. So. Uh, I'll be able to obviously tie that to Easter for obvious reasons. Uh, but before we get into the sermon, I also want to pray. Oh, also, one other thing. Uh, you might not have seen my wife sitting with me. She's doing the slides. So if anything is uh, off kilter, if something goes wrong, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to say anything more. I might get myself in trouble. Uh, but, Yeah. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's, let's pray before we get into the sermon. Heavenly Father, you are good and you alone are good. We are thankful for your son, your son who cleanses us, your son who took on so much suffering, your son who went to a place that he knew he was going to be killed he went to the people that he knew he was going to be handed over by to be crucified. And he gives us an opportunity at true life. God, we pray that you would sanctify us. That uh, your spirit would enter our lives. That your spirit would radically change who we are as people. That we would look like your son. That we would be graceful. That we would be merciful. That would be, we would have forgiveness. That we would show others love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How much rest do you get? Apparently, adults ages 18 through 60 should at least get seven hours a day, and apparently only a third of adults get that, seven hours a day, and it's another question of whether or not those seven hours are even quality hours of sleep, right? I know that some people in here, Robbie does not get near what he should. Uh, and, and we could go into the statistics of how much we have watching screens, like our screen time. We could, we could go into the statistics of how much the average adult works a week. We could go into the statistics of how much the average parent spends time with their children. To say the least, that all that time adds up to a whole lot, and it leaves very little time for rest. Not to mention the amount of suffering that most people experience in life. Uh, we can witness it around us. We can witness it with people in Little Rock. We can witness it with people in Mississippi. We can witness it in Tennessee. The amount of pain, the amount of suffering, uh, the amount of time we don't have for rest because we are restless. How many of you in here on a consistent basis, keyword consistent basis, feel rested. Like, say, say you can go a whole week and you feel well rested. Raise of hands, anybody? <laughs> not a single person, right? There's not a single person in here who is consistently well rested. And as we talked about last week in John chapter 5, there is an issue with the Sabbath there is an issue with rest. So we're going to read the text that we're going to deal with in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and we're going to ask the question, well, what is the Sabbath? So John chapter 5, verses 8 through 18. We're going to read some of what we read last week just to kind of uh, recall. Verses 8 through 18 in John chapter 5 says this. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And now once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked, now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man that said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. 
The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So what is the big deal? What's the deal with the Sabbath? To begin, I want to first start with a Bible project video because they do a very good job concisely explaining things, and then we're going to go all the way back to Genesis. So if you could play the Bible. The number seven is a big deal in the Bible. Yeah, in biblical Hebrew, the word seven is connected to the idea of fullness or completeness. And that's something we all long for, but don't often experience. Instead, we find ourselves working endlessly, fighting back chaos with no real rest. Yes. Now keep all that in mind as we turn to Genesis 1 in the Bible. It begins with darkness and disorder, but then God speaks to bring about light and order so that life can flourish. And this happens over the course of six days. Each day is marked with the phrase, there was evening and there was morning. But on the seventh day, something special happens. God stops and rests. Right. Creation is brought to its completion on the seventh day. And that phrase, there was evening and there was morning, it doesn't appear on day seven. It's like a day with no end. On the seventh day, God's presence fills his creation. The land provides for all of God's creatures, including humans, who are appointed to rule the world with God forever. Kings and queens of the seventh day rest. I can get into that. But the humans are deceived by a dark power and they forfeit that rest. They're exiled into the wilderness where they have to work as slaves to the land. Until they die and return to the dust from which they came. But God wants to restore humanity back to that seventh day rest. So he chooses to give the family of Israel that experience of ultimate rest so they can share it with others. But how? They're in Egypt, slaves to an oppressive empire who's grinding them into the dust. So God confronts Egypt and he liberates the Israelites, taking them through the darkness and chaos on the way to the promised land. Now, while they're on their way, they find themselves in the wilderness. It's easy to get lost, life is a struggle, they're not in the land of rest yet. But while they're on the way, God invites them in the wilderness to start living as if they're in the promised land. But how do you practice the future rest in the wilderness? Well, God tells them that every seventh day, they are to stop their work, or in Hebrew, to Shabbat, so that they can rest and enjoy God's good world. So take a whole day to live as if the ultimate rest has already come. Yeah, this is the Sabbath, celebrated every week on the seventh day. But there's more. The Sabbath is just one of seven festivals that Israel practiced every year, each one anticipating that seventh day rest. That is a lot of sevens. And there's even more. Every seven years, the Israelites were to liberate slaves, forgive debts, and let the land rest for a whole year. And then every seven times seven years was the ultimate seventh day rest called the year of Jubilee. If anyone had lost their land or gone into debt, all was forgiven, everything restored. Wow, so the Sabbath, these feasts, the year of Jubilee, it's all pointing towards the hope of future rest. Right. Now, when the Israelites went into the land, they forgot their God, and so they forfeited their chance for rest in the promised land. They're exiled and enslaved again by an oppressive nation, led back into a world of chaos and disorder. But Israel's prophets said that their exile would end one day and that the ultimate jubilee of freedom and rest would come, but generations go by and they're still waiting. It's at this dark point in the story that Jesus appears and he launches his public mission on a Sabbath day. Yeah, he read aloud from the scroll of Isaiah saying that it was time for all captives and slaves to be released because this was the year of the Lord's favor. What did he mean, this is the year of the Lord's favor? He was talking about the ultimate jubilee. Also, Jesus is claiming that seventh day rest would come through him. Right, he said that he was the Lord of the Sabbath and he confronted disorder and darkness and all of its forms, liberating people from sickness, sin, even from death itself. Yet, Jesus was killed, so even his work was undone. Well, it seemed that way. But notice, Jesus timed his death to take place at the end of the week. His body rested in a tomb during the Sabbath and on the eighth day, he rose from the dead. 
Oh wait, the eighth day? You mean the first day of a new week. Exactly. Jesus' resurrection was like the first day of a new creation, where God's light and life broke into the darkness. So because of the resurrection, we have hope in God's promise of future rest. But we're not there yet. It's like we're still in the wilderness, where we experience struggle and pain. But as we journey towards that ultimate seventh day, Jesus invites us to experience a taste of real rest now by following him, or in his words, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Those videos always do a great job at concisely explaining some things, and it does a great job explaining the Sabbath. So what is the big deal? It pretty much answers a good bit of that, but obviously this video, it jumps all the way, you know, it goes from the beginning to the end as to how God has been moving to restore Sabbath rest. But for now, I want to focus on the beginning. So Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The text says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Here's a question for you. How is God tired? Or is that what the text means when it says God rested? Well, as the video already kind of talks about, God resting is more about God dwelling in and enjoying his creation. Just get back to Genesis chapter 2. I just went back to John 5. Genesis chapter 2. Skip up ahead and go back to chapter 1, verse 31. It said, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Key word, was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day creation was very good and as the video highlighted there's a difference between the sixth and the seventh day there is no evening there is no morning on the seventh day it's just god dwelling in his creation with mankind enjoying creation but then one chapter after genesis 2 what happens the fall now let me ask you something do we ever see god resting in his creation again after the fall no. Unfortunately, the Sabbath became what it wasn't meant to be, hence why there's a movement of God throughout history restoring Sabbath rest. So what did the Sabbath become? Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. The text says this, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. See, the Sabbath became a commandment. It became one day out of the week. Is that what Sabbath was originally? No. It was God resting in his creation with mankind, enjoying creation in his full presence. Perhaps God, he made it one of the commandments to remind his people of what they're missing out on. Or they work most of the week, we work most of the week, and then maybe one day we try to rest, but that one day does not compare to the fullness of God in creation. See, the command of the Sabbath is but a shadow of what it will be. 
Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not saying we shouldn't seek to rest. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to practice Sabbath. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to dwell with God in his presence and find rest. That's not what I'm saying. But we have something amazing to look forward to. So what's the deal with the Sabbath in John chapter 5? What is the deal? Look at verses 10 through 12 again. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, remember there was this paralyzed man, paralyzed for 38 years. They say to this man, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Do you get that? They, they look at this man who had just been healed. They look at this man who had been suffering for 38 years, this man who has been laying on the ground suffering and say, You know what? Sit back down. If you were in that position, would you sit back down? Once you receive healing that you had not before, once you receive rest, really, that you had not before, would you sit back down? See, in this case, I think the Pharisees are absolutely wrong. I think they misunderstand the point of the Sabbath, right? And Jesus, as the video already mentioned, Jesus highlights this in Luke chapter 4. So go to Luke chapter 4 real quick. Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. The text says, And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That phrase there, the year of the Lord's favor, that's in reference to the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year, that is a product of the Sabbath. So do you see what Jesus is claiming here? I'm bringing about that year. I'm bringing about that year where deaths are forgiven, where people are healed, where people actually experience rest. That's what he's doing. That's what he does when he heals this man. He is giving him a taste of the rest that is to come. Jesus healing this man on the Sabbath is actually a fulfillment of the Sabbath. But the Pharisees don't get that. The Jews don't see that. Verses 15 through 17, John chapter 5. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. They persecuted Jesus because he healed a man. Uh, and notice here in this text, Jesus, he doesn't protest their assumption when, when he says that they've, he, he violated the Sabbath. Technically, Technically, Jesus is violating the commandment of the Sabbath. But the thing is, Jesus knows the Sabbath way more than they do. He knows what it'll be in him. And as he says in verse 17, My Father is working until now, and I am working. My Father, God, has been working on the Sabbaths. The God that you worship, the God that you praise, has been working until now, and I am working. Why? Well, recall the last time the text said that God rested in creation before the fall. See, God has been working to restore things as they should be, and Jesus works as the Father works, working to bring true rest. Verse 18 says this, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. A lot of people get confused. uh, How is this God? The Jews weren't confused. (laughs) They knew exactly what Jesus meant when he said, I'm the son of God. He was making himself equal with God. Really, he was making himself God. Jesus is God. But the Gospel of John, as we've already touched on, has established that. 
the first thing the Gospel of John wants to make very clear is that Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, the Son and the Father, God, has been working to restore rest. As clearly demonstrated today, there's not a single person in here who consistently feels well rested. I mean, quite frankly, sleep is not even what true rest is. Think about that. In God's creation, in the new heaven, the new earth, in heaven, uh, there's not going to be any sleeping. There's not going to be any sleeping. It's just going to be day. It's just going to be us dwelling in the presence of God. We won't need sleep. We will have true rest. Rest from suffering, rest from pain, rest from everything that is so fallen about this world. So do you want rest? Do you want complete, true rest? You're not going to find it here. You're not going to find it in anybody else except Jesus as we stand and sing.